I didn't quite understand. But later on, I understood what happened as somebody had actually painted over one of my paintings in Korea in graffiti. You know how that means when somebody goes over you, you want to kill the person. They had given me such a big international buzz. You know, I was like, this is free press. This is gonna, this is gonna help me out of, you know, I wasn't really so mad at the couple because sometimes, you know, people, people don't know. And especially this Korean couple, they didn't really know. John Wan is a abstract graffiti artist from New York. Born in the 60s, we speak about what life was like back then. We also speak about an incident that happened in 2021. Whilst in Korea at one of his shows, a couple deformed one of his paintings, which is reported to be worth $500,000. We speak about the business behind the art market and basically what he's up to now. John Wan, you're a legend and thank you very much for your time. We're on with Mr. John One, yeah, a street artist, legend, and someone that I've been chasing down for many weeks now. But finally, yeah, a persistence paid off. I've actually got him onto the podcast, yeah, and welcome on board uh, for the Stephen Sully podcast, as well as uh, some content for our private art gallery, Woodbury House. So, welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So, so got you actually down as John Andrew. Perello, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's my schizophrenic, schizophrenic name. Yeah, I have two personalities. Maybe okay. three, you know. Okay, all right, that's cool. Well, this is, okay, that's my well, real name. Okay, well, this is going to make, make it a good, good, interesting podcast. Then um, I know you were born originally in New York City in America, which is a great city. It's almost become our second home, Woodbury House, yeah. in 1963. And what I have found by doing a lot of research on you, John, you, you started a group called 156 All Stars in 1984. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about this group, All Stars, back then. Okay, so, yeah, I, I grew up in, in, in um, Washington Heights. And, um, you know, New York City, especially Manhattan, is divided into numbers. And, you know, you got 125th, you got 59th Street. So I grew up, you know, there's like a red line and, and there was a red line really in New York at that time. So everybody, um, you know, the, the New York that you see in, in postcards, the Empire State Building ends at 96th Street or maybe 110th or right. maybe 120, no, 116th Street. That's where Columbia University is. And so after that, it's the ghetto. It's the no man's land, you know? So I grew up in a no man's land and it was like, my street number was 156. Usually when you grow up in a no man's land, what is there? There's nothing to do. It's the ghetto. You're bored. It's like, what is the equivalent of that in, in, in London? If you live in Bristol or something like that? Um, I mean, look, in, in London, you got the suburbs. Uh, yeah. um, but I or in England. Say, yeah. I, I, so, I mean, I guess they call it in the countryside or in the sticks. where like it's tricky, bit, tricky. Where did he grow up? Tricky. You know, tricky 3D. Yeah, I don't actually know. I think it, I think it was actually Bristol. That's where yeah, Bank, yeah, Bristol because where he, Banksy's from. I, I met him a couple of times, and he he described Bristol as being like you know Bristol, you know, like nothing to do with the ghetto and stuff like that, like a rough a rough part of England. So I grew up in in 156. There was nothing to do, and um, so out of that boredom, um, I guess you know our playgrounds became the trains you know that's what we were you know we were, we would were jump the the trains you know the, the the thing and and um and we were playing there in the in the trains you know yeah we would go to the yards and paint and and then we would meet up at 156th street okay and um and we would talk graffiti the whole day and smoke blunts <laughs> <laughs> i yeah. um I've got you down as well that, you know, your, your stage name, your uh, artist name is John One, but you also yeah. refer to as well as this 156. So yeah. it's quite a culture that a few of you had that attached to, to their names, that 156. Element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think because um, um, 156, um, you know, it, 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 brought, it brought together a lot of different types of artists, you know, and, and that's what was amazing. And it's always amazing for me because, um, you know, you had so many, I was around so many talented artists and I'm so grateful and for that, like, 
you know, I was thinking the other day of Omni. He was 156. And Omni was a friend of Zephyr. You know, I don't know if you know Zephyr RTW, but um, these are like legends, urban legends. And so I was around all these urban legends and, and 156 was, you know, we were getting busy. We were painting on trains. Like this afternoon, I'm going to go see West. I don't know if you know West, but he lives in California now. And he was also part of this sort of movement. You know, he was part of FC Fame City, which eventually was like the first crew that was, um, that um, Cause was down with, you know, Cause, the famous Cause. Yeah. So we were just like uh, around so much talent at the time. It was like, I'm just so grateful. So 156, we were, you know, you, you had Omni, you had Rack 7 in the Bronx, you had Kyle in Queens and um, and we were pulling out productions on trains, you know, like top to bottoms and window downs. And and yes, of course, Nemo was there too. Nemo, little Nemo, you know, <laughs> Nemo Labrizi, he was down with it too. So it was a very special moment in New York, you know? Yeah, Nemo, I never got to meet his father. I wish I had, but I've read. Yeah. Uh, and watched uh, his father, Rick Nabrizi, on the Shadow Man documentary and in other publications, etc. And he seemed to be a real OG as far as, you know, you know, connecting artists to collectors or galleries. And he was a great businessman, but also had his feet firmly on the ground. And I think those characteristics have been passed down to Nemo. Nemo is so good at communicating, articulating the style and the thought-provoking messages behind an artist. And again, he said so many good things about yourself, John. Oh yeah, Nemo, that's my boy. Yeah. And his father was so special. I mean, I'm an artist today because of his father. He was like, um, you know, Rocky, um, when he was, you know, the movie Rocky, uh, when he was like um, training those other boxers. Well, he was a little bit like that. He was, he trained me to, to think, like an artist, you know, because, you know, you can be very, um, let's say, talented and whatnot, yeah. but you have to, you know, painting is, is a lifestyle above anything. So you have to be able to embrace this, this lifestyle for the good and for the bad, because, um, you know, creation for me is a, it's a necessity. It's a way of breathing. It's a way of living. So there's no alternative lifestyle to it. I have to be in a studio. I have to be around painting. I have to be in this world to feel good about myself. If not, I'm depressed, you know, and I bored. I totally hear it. So yeah. my kind of connection to that is this. I train quite a lot. You mentioned about boxing. I box. I've had 16 yeah. fights. I had a fight in March just gone. And I even trained this morning. And... I do get sometimes people who are not so motivated by health or exercise, et cetera, say to me, oh, you must be so disciplined. For me, it's gone beyond discipline. It's now a lifestyle. And I can only imagine for someone like yourself that painting, creating, it's not a discipline, it's a lifestyle. You have to do it. Yeah, it's yeah? exactly it. Is that it. I, I, I mean, it's my past, my present, and my future. And it's the way that I sort of talk to myself and meditate to myself and find balance. So, you know, I mean, it's not for everybody. Not everybody has that, um, you know, that motivation to paint, you know, it's, you know, it's not a necessity in life, you know, but for me, it's, it's, um, it is a necessity. I think it's the most beautiful, the most beautiful thing. You know, well, I, I combine it also with music and watching dances. I live in a very visual sort of world and, always in search of beauty and, and, and you know, but beauty in, in its, it, beauty doesn't have to be in the sense of like the, um, uh, I like the rawness of things. I like the ugliness of things. I accept all types of expressions and um, I try to express and be open to other forms of expressions. So um, yeah, I like people to express themselves, you know? Yeah, I think turning a, a blank canvas into a, a magnificent piece of art must give you so many benefits. It must be therapeutic. It must, you know, create this endorphin rush. It must, it must make you kind of 
like you said earlier, it's like breathing. You know, it's a yeah. form of, of, of breathing for you, which is important. You did mention something at the start of this conversation, which I didn't know and I didn't find when I was researching you, which you mentioned about schizophrenia. Yeah. Now, I've interviewed so many different artists from okay. Days, Crash, oh, wow. uh, Lee Quinones, Bisco yeah. uh, Smith, uh, Al Diaz, LA2, um, uh, wow. you know, a, a, bu a bunch of different artists. And Nemo's obviously been on my podcast. And it does seem, certainly from New York and America, you know, back then, the culture of doing drugs or mental health, which wasn't really spoke about much back then, like it is now, was a bit of a thing. I mean, if you look at uh, Basquiat or even uh, uh, Richard Hamilton, there was obviously the drug usage, uh, usage etc. Was that a thing back in the day with you, John? And do you think that might have contributed towards your schizophrenia, maybe? No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was taking no, no, but that's two different things. That's like the schizophrenia and the and the drug use. You know, it's like um, there's no shame in my game. I was, I was like, I was, I was in it. You know, that was my lifestyle. I was part of my lifestyle. I was getting high. You know, because it, you know, it's a, it was a different generation. It's not like today's generation where you sort of know what's going on. Back then, nobody knew what was going on. You, everybody was smoking the crack, and dust, or, or weed, or blunts, or sniffing coke. It was, it was, it was available. You know, so when you had this availability in your communities. Of you know, you know, you you dip and dab in it. So, you know, I was in it and I was official. I was like, you know, I was like uh I was like the, uh, a captain or general or and um but um I was thinking about that the other day, you know, even I think about that part of my life, that chapter in my life, and um and there was no alternatives. You had to sort of like um that, that was the way of being down, you know, like, like the Indians before they used to um, pass the, the peace pipe. Yeah. And you have to take a, you know, so you had to, you had to be part of this, um, this cipher, you know, this group. And definitely um, I was down with that. And that's what provided me the opportunities to meet these incredible artists that I met, you know. Because if you weren't in the cipher, you were outside of the cipher and you weren't exchanging at the same level of, of mentality with these great artists. So, you know, I, that was part of the sacrifices. I wouldn't see it as a sacrifice, but that was sort of like the initiation process of me, um, of the creativity part of my life, you know, of letting go, that whole letting go, because you know, nowadays people are so grounded and so conscious of their images and what they're doing. And, and, you know, it's like, it's incredible, but sometimes you just gotta let go and let things come to you. And and that was the process of, 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 of the eighties and the seventies, I guess, you know? Yeah, I, I hear that. Um, I, I my, my, my wife, but back then she was just my girlfriend. We, we went to um, Thailand. Okay. A bit, bit, bit of traveling for like two and a half, three weeks. Yeah. And we went to a place called Chiang Mai, which is north, where there's a lot of tribes. And we got taken into the, the jungle for two nights with wow. a tribe leader called Tiger. Wow. I mean, even his, even his name itself is exciting, you know. And yeah. we went in on like bow and then on an elephant and then we stayed with a tribe. And what it reminds me of is when they were smoking opium yeah. in there, it was the culture, you know, every yeah. tribe smoked a little bit of opium. And yeah. when you say opium, people start thinking about heroin and that kind of stuff. In yeah. actual fact, all it was was a bamboo shoot. At the end of it was a bottle and they used to peel the poppy seed, leave it out in the sun so it became sticky, pull it in the uh, bottle and then inhale the vape. So yeah. that's that was their version of opium. And yeah. it didn't really make them weird or anything like that. It just made them relax. And as you say... Yeah made them let go, you know, just, yeah. just let go and have have a bit more of a free spirit approach to life. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. That's that was uh that was the the rock and roll period, you know. So it was part of the scenery or the background of of the insanity of New York in the 80s, you know, and so I come from that generation.
Yeah, I and uh, yeah, I I I, I uh, fully fully uh, yeah. uh, uh, resonate with you when you say that it was the culture, it was an era, and yeah. also the 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 things that we know now about health, drugs, yeah. or drinking, etc. We didn't actually know back then. I mean, let's remember one thing: there was a time where doctors on TV were promoting Camel cigarettes as health as healthy. Wow. And, then, and then many years later, we find out that actually it's, it's a cause to cancer. So completely, yeah. completely uh, took a 180 degree turn. Yeah. Um, can I just round off this, this segment by, by asking you then about the schizophrenia? I mean, when did you get diagnosed? With oh, no, I'm not diagnosed. I, I make fun of it, you know. All right, OK. I, I have a friend of mine. He, he brought, he's an artist and he says, I got seven personalities. So I, I, say, I say to myself, I got two personalities, which is kind of true. You know, I have that John Perello, which is the, let's say the normal guy, you know, the, the guy that um, Mr. Mr. You know, whatever. And, and, uh, and then you have the, the John one, which is like this exciting guy that travels over the world that does these colorful paintings. That's very social and very like, you know, does expositions and has an artistic vision and and then you know so it's it's really two personalities and sometimes it's it's really hard to let's say people to live with me because um when I get home sometimes from from a show or from from traveling or something like that it's hard for me to come calm down and become you know that John Perello the 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 husband or the the father or the um or the mr you know mr norma i I, i'm just always amped up i want to do something you know i want to keep on traveling keep on doing things keep on another project and and yeah yeah so it's it's really you know it is two personalities you know yeah it is so doing my maths here because i'm 36 years of age yeah yeah? i'll go to 1985 so you must be wow okay you must be in and around the 57, 58 mark. Exactly. I'm 58 years old. I'm going to be 59 in November 30th. So. Well, can I just say this one thing? I mean, only speaking to you on the phone, but now seeing you on this Zoom and interviewing you, which I'm very, very blessed to do. How the hell your approach is 60 years of age? Yeah. How do you still stay motivated and so driven and so much energy, wow. John? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's it is because um, I guess um, I'm very fortunate enough to be in, in, involved in something so exciting, you know, something so it's like um, it's magic, you know, and it's like I, I want to keep that fire alive. You know, I never get bored of it. It's it's something I identify myself with. And and um, yeah, it, it is tiring a bit because I've been doing it for so long. And sometimes I get flashbacks of everything I've done. And, um, but, uh, you know, I love what I, I love what I do and I love um, being around artists. So this is exciting for me. You know? Yeah. Um, I'll give you a short story. I was approached in 2014 by one of Nemo friends, a big art dealer. And he said, look, I represent this guy who's known by the New York Times as a godfather street art. Yeah. Have you heard of Banksy? And I said, well, yeah, I'm British. You know, everyone knows who yeah. Banksy is. Yeah. In actual fact, even if you're not British, you know, if you know, if you think about art, um, one of the top names will be uh, Banksy a lot of the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And anyway, he said, look, this guy's called Richard Hamilton. There's a Shadow Man documentary coming out of him. Why don't you take a look at, be, look at his work? And anyway, John, I fell in love with it. And we started our first uh, brand back in 2014, which is this. Woodbury House behind me. And now we've done shows all around the world. We're about to move into Banksy's former gallery in Mayfair, wow. Sackville Street, which yeah. I sent over to you. And it's just been a complete exciting journey, a complete whirlwind, and it's been fantastic. Wow. I do like to ask my guests who are artists who are from the era, yeah. Richard Hamilton, the Godfather Street Art, the Shadow Man. Yeah. And um, what did you know him? What can you tell me about him? What's your thoughts and feelings? Well, I didn't personally know him because, you know, I left New York in 1987, you know, so that was like, I, I had to go, you know, and I came to Europe and, and when I came to Europe, I was more, I was really involved into the European graffiti scene out here. So um, with Mo2, I don't know if you heard of him and, 
and some other British graffiti writers and some, so, but Richard Hamilton was definitely a figure in the New York City, you know, um, you know, underground scene, I right. would say. He was really um, like a Lower East Side. You would see his stuff all over, all over the place. And, and yeah, you would ask yourself the questions. Like when you go to the museums, you ask yourself like, who is this guy? Why is he doing it? And what is he trying to say? So um, yeah, he was really, um, you know, Richard Hamilton is, is uh, it was really, um, I sometimes when I see his work, it's, it's really like New York, it represents to me, New York, uh, the, the grimy period of not, but grimy in a good sense, you know, cause like when you see John Michel Basquiat's work, you also feel that griminess, you know, that roughness, that rawness in it. Mm. And, and, and that roughness and rawness, it, it, he made it, it turned it into beauty. You know, it's like a polished stone. So um, the same thing with Richard Hamilton, there was like a sort of, of chaos going on and, and some sort of like, um, it, was, it was just raw. And it's to find the beauty in that rawness. And I think Richard Hamilton captured that very well, you know? Yeah, and w would you support, you know, the New York Times did call him the Godfather Street Art. I mean, how, how true is that? I mean, that's the New York Times perspective in saying, I think, I think you can't really say he was the godfather of, uh, of, of uh, street art or whatnot, because there was so many players and so many things going on, you know, maybe they want to pick him. But, um, you know, it, it was just, it was, it was like a movement going on. So, you know, like you said, you interviewed Lee, for instance, you know, and Lee is one of my all time greatest, you know, um, when I see Lee, I, I become like a little kid because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Lee, his message was very, also very, very powerful in what he was saying, you know, when he did that train, stop the bomb and um, USA um, versus USSR trains. And he was also very political in what he was saying. And he was uh, like above everybody in, in, in his, you know, in his way of thinking. He was always an example for me. So, um, you know, and also Crash and Days were an example for me. So, it just depends what perspective you're seeing. Cause sometimes like let's say Richard Hamilton, it wasn't really speaking to um, uh, certain communities in New York, you know? And so um, it just depends which community you want to talk to, you know, maybe if you were like Lower East Side type of, you know, type of people, yeah, why not? You know, I was all city. So I was hanging out with everybody. In yeah. New York, I mean, Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, um, all over the place, but um, I was a lot in, in, in the Bronx too. So in, in the Bronx, you had T-Kid, you know, I don't know if you heard of T-Kid. Um, um, not T -Kid someone I'm, was, I'm um, actually familiar with. T-Kid was like, um, you know, he was part of, um, he's down with Goldie, you know, and so it's just like, you know, New York was just so much full of energy and everybody was an artist. So it was like, yo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so unlike, let's say Basquiat, unlike yourself, unlike Futura, unlike, unlike Lee, unlike Crash, unlike maybe Days and, and so many others. A lot, of, a lot of you guys, the culture was to start with tagging, you know, yeah. have, have, have your name up on the wall. Yeah. And some people stayed in that lane and they've become very good at it. Yeah. Some of you, including yourself, do, do still float back to that, but you've evolved into like more contemporary contemporary artists I would say and more like fine art this is my perspective but when I think about Hamilton and Harry they, yeah. they they never really done the whole tagging it was just kind of street art on the wall so you had the shadow figures by Richard Hamilton yeah and then you had the 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 kind of cartoon like babies or mm. or figures by by, by Harry but as yeah. we well know out Diaz and also Basquiat, they started with Samo for a year and a half or two years or whatever. And then Basquiat went on to do his in incredible work. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, would you support that, that a lot of street artists back then, 70s, 80s, and then maybe even before, yeah. started with the tagging, then worked their way up onto the trains like Lee did, and yeah. now they're doing these fantastic canvases and working with some of the biggest art um, galleries around the world and even museums, uh, John. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, you're right. You're definitely right. You know, it was just like, um, it was just so much, so much creativity at, at that time and so much going on. And, and um, just to have grown up in, around that was, was, was just so rewarding for me. Yeah. So, you know, you would go to these parties and, and these people would be there, you know, and you would be able to talk to them and exchange with them and, and maybe even smoke a joint with them and go to their house, you know, so. Is that, um, did you ever meet people like Haring or Basquiat? Um, yeah, I mean, I seen Basquiat, I seen Keith Haring, you know, but, um, you know, that was like, a, let's say, uh, another league in itself, you know, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't really, let's say, it wasn't my, let's say, element, because I, I was coming from another element, you understand? And like, let's say the Basquiat crowd, like Basquiat was, um, was really into drugs. He was like, uh, he was getting high a lot. And I wasn't at that, I'm not knocking him down, but it was just another level of, of, of uh, another level, you know? And mm. Keith Haring, you know, uh, I wasn't really hanging out with Keith Haring, even though, you know, he liked Puerto Rican guys and stuff like that. But, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to give up my booty, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, to hang. No, but I'm not saying he was, he was, he was like, you know, he was, he was, he was with every, you know, every guy, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't in that cypher, you know, I was in a, a boy toy, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so I, I, um, I, I was more up in the ghettos, you know, I was up in the ghettos and so I would go downtown a bit and I hang out with my friends, but at nighttime, I'd always go back to the ghetto. So me, I was, I was in a different reality of, uh, of existing, you know? Yeah. You, you say about uh, the Puerto Ricos, because um, LA2, Angel mm -hmm. Ortiz, yeah. uh, they were collaborating a lot and it, and it seemed to be the only way Keith Haring really got into the, onto the streets, maybe even to like, you know, rough parts, maybe the yeah. Bronx, et cetera, et cetera. His yeah. way in was via Angel Ortiz because he was yeah. from the streets. Yeah. And he was, um, I believe, Puerto Rico. In actual yeah. fact, he's coming over at the end of the month to London, first time in many, many years. Wow. To do an art show with a, with, with a gallery in, uh, in Shoreditch, wow. which is going to be quite cool. So I'm going to go over and see him. But yeah, yeah I mean, as well as like a, a painting partnership, do you think there was more than that with LA2 and also Keith Haring? Yeah, that's good. I mean, he is well deserved. LA Two's been around for such a long time, and he deserves the recognition because he definitely, you know, the collaborations he did with um, with Keith Haring's definitely it was beautiful collaborations, and and he deserves his props. Yeah, he does. He does. He's a bit. He's a, he, he's a bit unforgotten because I think a lot of the concentration sometimes is on Haring, and people don't yeah. realize that. A lot of the Haring works, the squiggles in between were the contribution yeah. of LA2. And also, I think he became a bit of a victim of his own lifestyle, you know, becoming a bit of a recluse and, and maybe yeah. too much on drugs at one stage. And I think now that, and I don't want to blame his, his partner, but when she died, it seems like he, he's kind of resurrected his kind of drive to start making really incredible art again, which he has been doing. And he's yeah. now going to travel to the UK. And it's quite wow. exciting to see the... Pro progress by him if mm -hmm. i can ask you the last kind of to round this bit off and i want to ask you a lot more about your own career and what what's happening now but okay. keith Haring, jean-michel basquiat richard hamilton yeah part of the reason why nemo told me that richard hamilton works in auction and in the private domain didn't go to the tens of millions of dollars as quickly as both of the others is because he didn't die you know it's just, it's okay. as simple as that he only died in 2017 yeah with major galleries, with museums, with major drive behind collectors and fanatics and investors behind Hamilton's work, can you actually see his works going to the same sort of heights as Jean-Michel Basquiat or even Keith Haring? Um, um, well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of catching up to do, I guess, for to catch up to... Um, to um, Jean Michel Basquiat, and he's already established. He's, you know, he's a he's a blue chip artist, you know. So when you have a Jean Michel Basquiat, it's like you know, in your house, a, a painting is it's like, yeah, okay, you're doing pretty good. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of catching up to do, but um, 
you know, you never know artists, you never know. So I think in time, I'm not saying, you know, art is not a competition in, in the sense that, you know, every, every artist has his own career and his own, you know, his own public. And you really can't compare one artist to another. It's, it's very difficult. I guess Richard Hamilton will always have a place in history because, um, because of his work and what he contributed as an artist in, in that period of time. And there'll always be an interest um, with people um, because this generation was an interesting generation and it's, it was a very unique generation. It had something to say and people always use it as a look back into history and see, okay, what were these people all, all about? Because what's coming next, next is, um, you know, the generation of today is something totally different. They're dealing with different problems and, and um, different realities of life, you know, COVID and, and wars, um, you know, and it's just a different generation. So, but people will always look back into history and see what, you know, and learn, learn from us or learn from what was doing before. So yeah, there will always be an interest for Richard Hamilton, for sure. And, and do you know, like knowing or being around Jean-Michel Basquiat when you were living more permanently in New York? Yeah. I mean, look, you guys are the originators of this movement. You know, you contributed so much, you know, you're so valuable to the community. But do you know, like, <laughs> it's funny because what, in one breath, you know, one moment of your life, you, you, you're painting, you're doing your street art, you're smoking, you're socialising, yeah. etc. The next minute, fast forward the clock, you know, 30 odd years, nearly 40 years, mm -hmm. and the Basquiat in auction in 2017 sold for $110.5 million. I mean, it's mind blowing stuff. As an artist mm -hmm. who was in, in and around him at that time, but now fast forward the clock, seeing that, how does that actually just make you feel that ginormous amount of money? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm happy for Jean-Michel Basquiat and his career and what he's doing as an artist and what he has done as an artist. But um, yeah, I mean, what does it make me feel? I mean, Jean-Michel Basquiat has always been an example for me and a lot of different types of artists. And, um, but, you know, like, it's like my daughter. My daughter is um, 24 and 25 years old. She's 24 years right now. And um, she's interested in art, you know? And what she says is that, um, and it's very interesting seeing her per, um, point of view because, you know, she grew up around me, uh, you know? And she's like, um, you know, and she's 24. She says, you know what, Jean-Michel Basquiat and, and Keith Haring are like, for her generation, they're like Picasso, you know? Like a Picasso is worth, millions too you know but it's like after a while it's like so what you know because um my daughter says this this our generation that's also important like her generation of 24 and 25 of what they're doing you know they grew up seeing you know the john michelle Basquiat, the key pairing they've been fed that all their lives and now they want to express themselves and they want their generation to be heard and seen so i kind of like you know, when she told me that, it made me think about, let's say, the whole focus on on a, on a certain artist, John Michel Basquiat, and 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 Keith Haring. It makes me focus. It makes me say to myself, you know, there's so many other talents that are out there that are doing interesting things that they also um, have a value in what they have to say and and what they're doing. So I like things to open up a bit and not just be um, sort of focused on like let's say ten artists or on there's so many great talents out there and and, and there's room for everybody uh, absolutely i'll second that yeah. uh, john so i'm going to um just jump forward here and talk mm -hmm. about uh an event that happened with you okay, okay. all right so uh i got here from hype art uh mm -hmm. hype art april the 19th 2021 so you know a year and a bit ago they they published mm -hmm. this article and it says this and i'm going to read it verbatim okay okay john one Unfazed by a couple defacing his half a million dollar yeah. graffiti work. And then it goes on to say that this street art uh, exhibition it was called Street Noise in Korea. Yeah. Yeah. And it said that this, this is a quote apparently by you with just three brushstrokes, 
on my canvas, they had managed to cause a pl plentitary buzz, said yeah. Mr. John One. Yeah. And um, there's actually speculation that because they've added to it without even realising they're adding to a half a million dollar canvas work by your great self, John, yeah. they actually might have pushed it up in value. So let, let, me, let me just start from the beginning. Um, a, a, a couple uh, who were attending this exhibition in Korea yeah. defaced your original half a million dollar original artwork. How yeah. did you feel when that, when, when that first happened? Well, I didn't quite understand it because um, I was getting like, like messages from people telling me like, yo, I seen you and I seen, I seen an article of you on, you know, in the newspaper and things like that or in, in the internet. And, and so I didn't quite understand, but later on I understood what happened that somebody had actually painted over one of my paintings in Korea. And, you know, in, in, in graffiti, you know how that means when somebody goes over you, you know, you want to kill the person and whatnot, but this is not graffiti times no more. So what I kind of felt bad for the person that had brought the actual painting, you know, because um, it was a big collector and he really loved, my, he loves what I do. So he had invested a lot of money into that painting. So I felt bad for him, but at the same time, it had given me such a big international buzz. You know, I was like, whoa, this is, this is free press. This is gonna, this is gonna help me out a bit. So you know, I wasn't really so mad at the couple because sometimes, you know, people, people, you know, people don't know. And especially these Korean, these, this Korean couple, they didn't really know because, you know, they try to duplicate my studio in front of the, uh, in front of this big humongous painting. And so they just took a brush and they painted over it. They, they did some, you know, they, they signed their name on it. Yeah. So, it's, um, yeah. So, it's completely innocent on their behalf. Yeah. But let's just, like you'll probably know a bit more than I do, but the 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 investor collector who bought mm -hmm. your work, who clearly loves what you're about and the yeah. genre and also the the piece, spent invested half a million dollars into it. Yeah. Like, how did they feel when they invested half a million into one of your works and then they realised it was sabotaged by some bystanders? Oh, he 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 really felt bad. He was he was really really shook shook up about it, and um. Yeah, he felt really bad, and so I feel bad for him too. But at the same time, he got a lot of press. <laughs> yeah, do you know what it reminds me of a little bit, a, a tiny, tiny bit? When Banksy put that piece called "Lovers in the Air" into auction, yeah. and then they got shredded in half, and now it's called "Lovers in the Bin." Yeah? yeah, it instantly went up in value. And last year, I went back to the auction in Sotheby's in London to watch it being auctioned off again and it fetched over 18, you know, close to 20 million pounds in auction, okay? Wow. Now, even though that was a stunt pulled off by Banksy and what an yeah. incredible PR stunt that was, yeah. you know, almost defacing the artwork made it more valuable. And in your scenario, it wasn't premeditated, but no. it was completely, completely innocent. In yeah. actual fact, if I was the owner of that half a million dollar artwork that you produced, in actual fact, I would compare it to that and think, do you know what? Because it was done innocently, and this yeah. is a moment in time, and it probably would never be done again. Yeah. This actually made it more valuable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure he sees it like that, but uh, if it's more valuable, but um, definitely he got a he got a he got a lot of press for for a collector. You know, usually it's the artist that get the collector, but you know now he now he got a lot of press too. So. You know, let's see what let's see what we can do. I, what I'm gonna do with him next? You know, yeah. Hopefully he'll call me up again and and ask me to do something with him. Did he ever? Um, did he ever at the start say, "Oh, I want my money back and I'll ask for a refund"? No, no, no. There's no refunds with me. <laughs> fair fair, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, here's another good moment in time for you, which I've picked yeah. up. So. In 2007, Art Curio Auction in, yeah. in France, I believe that's in Paris, yeah? yeah. You had a one-piece sell, uh, it's called Max Point, um, yeah. a large canvas to a New York collector for 24,800 euro, which was a record yeah. for John won at the time. Yeah. It's the highest bid for a French artist obtained for graffiti. Yeah. So you basically broke all the molds and you actually set the standard for a, a, uh, for, for, 
for a graffiti urban artist setting yeah. records in France. Yeah. Now you've got that accolade. How 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 that must make you absolutely feel incredible. Yeah, it definitely did. It was a special moment in my in my life in my career to be able to 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 sell a painting at that price and and um, oh yeah, it, it was it was um, it, you know our Curiad was one of the first places, first auction houses to sell let's say graffiti. Yeah. In Europe, or maybe even the world, you know, I'm not sure. There was the like the they were the first ones to really start doing serious auctions around graffiti. So to be, you know, to be able to sell the highest at that at that particular time was great. But you also got to remember one thing: that I was one of the first ones to start doing paintings. Yeah. So that helped. So that's what you know. I, because um. When I came to Europe, I had seen what others had been doing. And at the same time from painting on trains, um, I said to myself, it would be good if I start to make paint on canvases to conserve my work for other generations to see. So even in the 80s, I was doing canvases and I was going in, into studios and hanging out with artists and, and not just doing, let's say, graffiti in the sense of, of like something. I was doing art for myself, but in the streets or in the, in the subways. So it's only natural, I think, that at that particular moment that um, being one of the first ones to start doing canvases that you know, I had one of the highest bids at, uh, at that auction. Well, what, why is it that, you know, um, someone may start, you know, doing, you know, a tag, whether that's their name or their artist name or something like Sam yeah. et cetera, but then yeah. they evolve into these yeah. great contemporary artists very much like yourself. I mean, one of the individuals that has really pulled it off that I think is a great artist and a very, very yeah. successful individual yeah. Is Futura. I mean, yeah. I have one of Futura tags at my home. Wow, you're so lucky. On, you're lucky. On, on canvas. And I also have a pair of Converse that he collaborated with them a few years ago. And he yeah. released a few pairs at yeah. the world famous Colette store in Paris. Yeah. And he's ticked all the boxes. He's a graffiti artist, a tagger. He's yeah. a contemporary artist that does these wild, amazing canvases. He also does collectibles with people like. Converse. So, you know, how, how come that evolves? Like, what, you know, what, why, why the need to evolve into this slightly different artist? I mean, um, that's a good question. I mean, every everything is individual because I wouldn't say it's for everybody. Not everybody wants to to um, walk in my shoes or walk in Futura shoes or walk in any artist's shoes because it's 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 rough to walk in in the shoes of an artist. But it's a, uh, it's um, I guess each artist has their motivations and their drives and their dreams. For me, for instance, um, after doing a lot of walls and things in the streets, I wanted to, I wanted to be able to like, part. I wanted other people to participate, and in it not just be me that's doing all the work. I wanted to have some different type of exchange and dialogue with the people that um um loved my work or encouraged my work and that's what pushed me to sort of like start doing shows or doing collaborations because i wanted the the um the dialogue to be a more mature dialogue and a, and a different dialogue with people where um there was a different sort of like um exchange yeah an exchange uh, you know it wasn't just a pat in the back it was like um because picasso once said he said, for an artist to succeed, he has to have success, you know? And I always believe in that, you know? And you, for an artist to grow, you need success. So I needed that. I couldn't just do everything on my own, you know? I needed success in order to be able to still be here today, you know? I've been painting, let's say, for... Um, um, I needed the success to um, to grow as an artist, you know? and. You know, what's interesting sometimes for me, and because um, as an artist, it's not just like, like let's say, uh, reaching a career high, it's having a, some sort of consistency. 
and having a career. That's what I, I, I search for with myself is to be able to still be able to express myself next year and the year after. Well, talking about consistency, I mean, I've just gone through your Wikipedia. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, my friend, you're one of the most prolific and most yeah. consistent artists out there. Yeah. I mean, you've done solo exhibitions from the year I was born, 1985, right up until last year, 2021. Yeah. And you've covered New York with La Breezy Gallery, which is yeah. clearly, you know, Nemo and his father. Yeah, you've done you've done shows in front. I mean, you've done shows pretty much all across the globe. Yeah. So I think being a success is, as you say, being consistent, and that keeps you relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't you can't live on your past. You know, you can't live on your past, and that's just um, very very um, important because. Um, as an artist, you try to build an image of, of yourself to the people that um, that are sensitive to your work. You know, you build, and it takes years to build an image. And once you have that image um, out there, then you have to consistently feed that image. You know, you have to consistently nourish that. You just can't have that image, and then all of a sudden, you know, you retire or you you disappear. So it's it's a nonstop sort of like um, um, I wouldn't say a job because being an artist is not a job, but it's a nonstop um, devotion. You never it never stops. Devotion is such a good word. And yeah. you said about your um, your image, yeah. And yeah. I know being in business that your image counts for a lot, and you need to be very very careful and aware who you're going to align yourself with. Yeah. And. As an artist, it might be a bit of a uh, conundrum sometimes when big brands are approaching you and they're throwing yeah. a lot of money at you, John. You know, they're they're making you wild big offers, yeah. which can be sometimes quite life changing or quite yeah. desirable. But you 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 might feel it might not be good, so good for your image. So if I can ask you, is there anyone that you've collaborated with that you've been thought it was a great success? And is is there anybody in the future that you'd like to collaborate with, whether that's other artists or whether that's you know, big big brands like the Nikes or the Adidas of yeah. this world. Well, um, yeah, collaborations are important. I've had the opportunity to do things with Air France and also Hennessy. I try to do things with companies that um, they have a relationship with artists, you know, and not just doing things to promote their brands, you know. So I'm very fortunate that um, that let's say. Um, 80%, 90% of what I, how I live is through my paintings. So I don't really have to rely on brands, you know. I kind of like, um, I, I kind of do shows and from there, um, uh, I do canvases and installations. So I'm more in an artistic sort of world than in a commercial commercial world but you know doing collaborations for me yeah I, I, there's plenty of people that that um i guess i would love to do something with them, but i have to think about it you know yeah fair, fair enough um it has I mean, to be an exciting project you know something very very exciting something that resonates something that gets your creativity flowing yeah. and you know move it around I, I i fully fully get that i mean at, at, at the same time it's not just about doing work for the sheer sake of it and getting paid it's about a feeling you know you need to yeah. you, it's got to feel right you know and only you will know if it, if it feels right or not um uh, so i've had alan ketz on my podcast oh yeah i'm gonna see him on friday yeah i've had uh say hey for me and i've had risk on my podcast who's wow. uh, I, I think from L, uh, la yeah and i've also had someone that you may know i think you do a guy called coke too yeah, yeah? Cool. yep now yeah. now I actually met up with him recently when I was in New York, but I've asked these guys because let, let, let's be let's be uh, real about the situation. When when you were younger and you were tagging and you're going onto the onto the trains, there was that element of risk because of a train may come, you could fall, you could damage yourself, hurt yourself, kill yourself, yeah. uh -huh. or there were gangs. And these gangs, you know, there was times where there were shooting, stabbings, etc. Yeah. And I've asked, I've asked LA, uh, sorry risk this uh, and even Alan Ketz and they said yeah there was times where I'm not going to say who said what but 
they either got shot or they 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 had to stab someone in order to defend themselves. Um, did you ever see anything like this? You know, the stabbings, the 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 shootings. Was you ever a part of it? You know, on either end of it, uh, John? Oh, definitely. You know, that was that was. Um, I mean, the streets is not like let's say today's version when you talk about street art and street artists. It's there's always associated with some sort of like you know, it's like a bohemian type of thing. But the streets that I grew up in were that exotic, you know. It's not even attractive, in the sense that um, there's poverty and and so much things going on. But um, definitely, since I came from those elements and those codes, because there's certain codes that go with it, that um, that uh, I've seen all that stuff and. And I've always tried to avoid it and uh, be one step ahead of it or one step away from it. You know, I, I had I always had that Spider-Man sense, you know, like, you know, like you ever see Spider-Man when, when the, I can walk, I could have, I could have my back towards somebody and I know somebody's following me. I can pass by somebody and not see their face and it'd be a group of guys and I know which one is gonna pop shit. I know which one I got to punch in the face first and I know which way to run. So I always had these like sort of like um, Spider-Man senses. Of course, I caught my beat downs and, and I got crazy stories of people fucking me up or I'm fucking somebody up. And, but um, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what creates the certain, my art, I guess. So authentic, authentic. I say it with a French accent. Unique. Authentic, authentic. Uh, authentic. Authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm forgetting my English now. <laughs> so um, that's what makes it so special, and because um, it went through that. It's not, a, a, let's say, an academic sort of um, schooling. My art, my art is, is, is. I wouldn't say it's the real deal, but you know, it's, it, it definitely comes from a certain era. Yeah, I remember Cope and uh, uh, Risk actually said. Um, I can't remember who said it, but. Someone actually got hit or fell off a bridge uh, when they were painting, and yeah. uh, they, they died. Have you got any any stories like that? Anyone that you lost? Oh yeah, you, there was you, my boy, um, Sane, Sane, which was the brother of Smith, and um, he was tagging on on a bridge, and he fell, and uh, he fell or he jumped, and they found him like a couple of days later, and he was all blotted up, and yeah, there's so many. You know, I have so many friends of mine, I mean, that are dead, like Rack 7, he fell off a fire escape, and it's just like the list goes on, you know, the list goes on. Yeah. I mean, we, um, you know, there's, in ghetto years, people don't live a long time, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. so if you're, if you're lucky to pass your 30s or 40s, you, you, you're, you're, you're lucky in ghetto years, you know. Yeah. So what, what's the plan for you next then, uh, John? Because uh, you've been prolific since uh, oh, yeah. 1985. I actually saw your humble beginning started uh, in, as a canvas artist back in Paris in a workshop in a, an old abandoned hospital, which is kind of like yeah. a, a, a squat. I mean, tell, yeah. me about the, tell me about this squat, this abandoned hospital. What was that like in there? Oh, that was exciting for me. I mean, it was like cheap artist studios. I, I used to live there. And there was so much talent in that in that um in that place. There was like artists like Thomas Hishorn, um, Robert Longo was there. There was Chinese artists. There was it was just like a melting pot of, of, of different types of artists. And and I was lucky to be part of the. It was called Hospital Ephemer. That's what it was called. And um, yeah, I mean, it was like the perfect place to live for me. Yeah. So so go, going from that to where you are now, traveling the world, you must feel very, very, very good about yourself. Um, if I were to get an idea, you know, speaking to my collectors, investors, lovers of street art and and just art as, as, as a whole, what 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 is a typical canvas going to set somebody somebody back from from you, John? What's the range? Oh, the range. Well, you know how artists artists are. They don't like to talk about, about money. <laughs> about money especially you know because it's a trap it's a, it's a piège and um but i guess you know everything is possible because i do um works on papers i do large formats i do small formats so i think if there's a will 
to have a, a peace of mind is, is possible, you know? It's just like, um, I do a lot of things for a lot of different type of budgets and, you know, I'm not- What's, what's the, okay, so it's in here in this article, half a million because of that Korean- uh, Yeah. Is that the most expensive art you've ever produced or have you got higher than half a million? No, that's probably the most expensive to, to my Korean collector, yeah. Well, that's a, yeah, well, that's, a, yeah. that's exciting. Going from you know uh, an abandoned hospital that this yeah. type of squat to, to where yeah. you are now. So, what's your plans in the next five or ten years, John? Where where are you going to be at? Well, that's the thing about art. I mean, you never really know. You know, hopefully, as you know, health wise, I'll be in good shape. You know, Ho hopefully, you know, I'll continue to be blessed. To, to wake up every day and be motivated to paint, you know? And um, where would I like to be in 10 years? I like to be in the studio and I like to be painting and preparing for a big show. And and I think in the next 10 years is, is probably gonna be the most exciting years of my life, you know? I really, really believe that because um, there's gonna be a certain maturity in my work in the next 10 years and um, and everything's gonna start to come together, you know? People are gonna start to see the volume I've worked um, before. And, and um, I, I really believe that um, 60s for an artist is very important, you know? Cause you're no longer like, when you're in the 20s, you're a young artist and whatnot. And, and people always like to help young artists, you know? They see the fire in their eyes and, and they like to, to feel good that they can participate in, in, the, in the beginning of an artist's career. But I'm no longer that, you know, 20 year old artist. I'm, a, I'm close to 60 and I'm gonna go into my 60s. And um, so I would say the way people look at my work now will be completely different than before. And, um, and, and I'm really looking forward to the next 10 years to, to, to see what I'm capable of doing and, and to see how I can affect not just a younger generation, but an older generation and, 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 and people in general, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's going to be interesting. I think the 60s are, are always the most exciting years for an artist, you know? You know what? As you said it and as you eloquently described that transition from the 20s all the way up to 60s it totally makes sense totally makes yeah. sense and I, I hear that you know sometimes when like if you were to buy a young artist yeah they're cool there's a lot of buzz there's a lot of hype yeah. but but the the downside to that is that could fall away yeah um, will they still be here in 40 years you know yeah yeah but with someone like John one with someone like a Richard Hamilton, in my perspective, with yeah. someone like, you know, someone that Matura, is- Matura, for instance. Matura. Like, incredible. In yeah. The 60s and, and I think in the 60s right now, he's at his prime, you know? Yeah. I see Futura painting and, and I say to myself, he's like an example of, he has so much energy and so much enthusiasm. It's even hard to catch up. I mean, it's hard to catch up with him. And I think he's really putting together um, his world right now. His, his, his language is, is becoming, much like exquisite, you know, like his, what is developed in this vocabulary of the future world now in the sixties is everything is coming together. And I hope that me as an artist in my sixties, my the whole language that I've tried to develop in my astro, abstract images, it all comes together and people are able to understand what I've been trying to express throughout all these years. I hear that brother. Yeah. Um, I, as I was gonna say, you know, some, some artists are fashionable yeah. But as we all know, fashion can die out and then it can reappear later on. Yeah. And some artists are significant to art history. You're one of them. Oh, Couture yeah. is one of them. Basquiat, Richard Hamilton, yeah. Keith Haring, etc. So I, I, I do believe when you say these next few years are going to be some of the best years of your life as an artist. Okay, yeah. Um, can I ask you one more thing? We, okay. saw, we saw an artist recently, a guy called Black the Rat, Oh yeah, black, 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 black the red. red. Yeah. So uh, he's known as the father of sensual graffiti, and mm. there's a clear connection between him and Banksy. Yeah. What do you think about Black's uh, artwork and also his market? Well, Black is is is, is a reference in in France, you know, because um, he's one of the pioneers of let's say the pochoir 
And um, I think he's, he's the coolest guy as, as, you, as a human being. He's always stayed humble and um, he's just a cool, cool French guy. And he represents a lot to me. And, and, and all these years I've been in France, he's the, the perfect gentleman, I would say. And, um, and, I, and he's did a lot to, to make, let's say, these bourgeois artists um let's say um bring bring value to them you know and um recently there was a, another Poshua artist that died her name was um mystique i don't know if, if you I heard her. yeah she died just a couple of months ago and um and i went to her funeral it was at Pere Lachaise, and it was one of the most beautiful funerals i've ever been in my life you know it wasn't a religious ceremony it was more of a an exhibition funeral yeah, it was more of an exhibition funeral. And that's what made it so beautiful that, uh, you know, everybody came and wrote on her, on her casket. And um, no, it was beautiful. It was really extremely beautiful. And I think Black is, what, Black is like that. John, I know you got to go. Okay. Yeah, but I want to ask you this one last question, a very simple one. Okay. I, I came up with a quote and it goes like this. Yeah. Be happy. Yeah. Never content. Yeah. So if I were to ask John one, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Well, it comes back to um, this saying that comes back in my mind always and always, never stop, never settle. Beautiful. I love yeah. that. All right, John, you're a gentleman. Uh, I'd love to get you, you over to Mayfair. <laughs> yeah. Let's just try to do some projects together and let's stay connected. Okay, brother. then. All right. And thank you very much. I'm so happy that finally we got this together. Absolutely. Okay. Top man. Great, great conversation. Right. Cheers. Bye-bye.